Hi guys, Jordan with Motion Array, and today we're talking all about lenses. Most of us know lenses as that really expensive piece of glass in front of your also very expensive camera. But why are there so many options? How do they even work? And how do I know which lens is right for me in each given situation? There's a lot of different questions in this topic that you could ask, so today we're gonna go over just a basic introductory course. Just a disclaimer, lenses are very complicated, and there's a million different things that we could cover in a video like this one. But today we're just gonna be going over the basics so that you have a place to start. So let's start simple. What is a lens and why do you actually need one? Well, let's take the lens off of the camera and see what happens. We get a blank white nothingness. Right now, light is hitting our camera sensor, but there's nothing else going on. The job of the lens is to focus that light so that when it hits your camera sensor, there's actually a discernible image. This is actually what the lens of your eye does. Focusing the light before it hits the back of your eyeball so that you can make out the shape of that expensive camera you just bought. So why won't just any lens work for what you're shooting? And why are there so many options? What's the difference between them? Today in this video, we're gonna be going over three basic topics. Focal length, aperture, and zoom versus prime. So let's start it off with focal length. Focal length by definition refers to the distance between the center of the lens and its focus. But for our purposes, it refers to how wide or how zoomed in your image looks. A wider lens like 16 millimeters, for example, will look more like this, showing a very wide amount of area for you to look at, while a 200 millimeter lens positioned in the same exact place will end up looking like this, allowing you to see way less of the scenery and making your subject appear way larger in the frame by comparison. There's a crazy number of different focal lengths that you could potentially have at your disposal. But in addition to just being wider or more zoomed in, each of these different focal lengths will have different viewing properties that you should be aware of. For starters, the wider your lens, the more distorted your image can become. If I'm too close to my wide angle lens here, it can actually start to make a real mess of my face, making it rounder and more alien than, for example, if I got as close as I could to my 200 millimeter lens while still being in focus the difference becomes very apparent. And you can see just how the focal length changes the way your subject's face looks structurally. Here we can try to show you some quick snapshots of how a person's face visually changes when you put them through different focal lengths. But the reason that it changes the way the shape of the face actually looks is because of the way the lens actually distorts the distance between two objects. We notice it right away with faces as people because we're so used to looking at faces. But you can also see it, for example, if we take this object in the background, filmed on a 24 millimeter lens, and then simply switch out the lens for a 200 millimeter one. We can see that now it looks like the object is much closer. This is because the wider lens makes things look farther apart while a longer lens will actually compress the distance between objects, making them look as if they're closer together, even though the real distance between them hasn't changed at all. So what does this actually mean for you? How do you use this information in a practical way? Well, for starters, if you wanna make it look like something is really far away from your subject, you can exaggerate it by using a wider angle lens. And to the contrary, if you wanna make it look like two things are a lot closer together than they are, you can use a longer lens to achieve this. A really practical example of that one is in fight choreography or any sort of stunts. That way you can make it look like your subject is way closer to the action when they're actually, in reality, a very safe distance away. But unless you're shooting something incredibly stylistic, you probably don't want to be just shooting at the two extremes. So then, what do you do with that middle zone? All throughout the middle between these two ranges are a variety of different focal lengths that can serve your purposes for all sorts of different occasions. Keep in mind the different characteristics that you saw at each of the extremes of those focal lengths. And as you start to get closer and closer to the middle and go farther away from the extremes, you'll start to see those characteristics diminish, all the way until you get to about 50 millimeters. Why 50 millimeters? Well, because that's what's been said to be the closest equivalent to what we see with our human eyes, and therefore what looks more quote unquote natural. This is why a range between 50 to 85 millimeters is said to be really great if you wanna get beauty shots. Shots of a person where you really wanna capitalize on making them look as good as you possibly can. Keep in mind, these aren't rules to be bound with. It's just information about how lenses work so that you can make the appropriate choice when necessary. And now let's move on to aperture. 
So when you hear people talking about lenses, you'll likely hear them talking about numbers that are associated with them. And if you hear things like 24 millimeters, 35, 50, 200 millimeters, you probably understand a little bit more about what they're talking about. But there's other numbers that people talk about when associating with lenses. Specifically, these are probably either the T-stop or F-stop number, but both of those have to do with aperture. Let me just stop here and say that yes, I realize that T-stop and F-stop are two completely different terms, and they mean similar things, but they're so different that they each need to be treated as their own separate term. But for the purposes of this basics tutorial, we're just going to stick with F-stop and go with that for now. Basically, the F-stop refers to the size of the opening of the lens. This number can change because lenses have aperture blades that can artificially make the hole larger or smaller. If the lens itself is marked with a particular f-stop number, that means that's the widest open the lens is capable of being. But when you're actually shooting with it, you might see an f-stop number on your camera's display, which will tell you how wide open that lens is at that particular moment in time. The lower the f-stop number for the lens, like for example with this cinema lens that goes down to 1.5, the wider open your lens is capable of going. The same goes for when your lens is actually in use. The lower the f-stop number, the larger the hole is that light's being let into. Whereas a higher f-stop number, like 22 for example, means that the hole is smaller. Cool, so what do you do with that information? Well, just like focal length, adjusting your lens's aperture settings will actually produce a different characteristic of your image. There's a couple different things that will happen as a result of either raising or lowering your f-stop number, but the first of which is that your image will either get brighter or darker. And it's pretty easy to understand if you just think about how much light is actually able to get through to your camera sensor. A larger f-stop number and a smaller hole means less light getting through to your sensor, and the image will be darker. But if you open up your lens's aperture as wide as it goes, you're going to let in significantly more light, and your image will be much brighter as a result, even if you make absolutely no other changes. It might sound pretty self-explanatory, but this isn't the only thing that changing your aperture does. As you raise your f-stop number, and therefore make the hole smaller, you actually make more and more of your shot in focus at the same time. The term that we use for this is called depth of field, and it refers to how much of your field of view is actually in focus at any given time. And like we said before, the larger the f-stop number, the wider this depth of field is. Meaning that if you have a very wide shot of a lot of different things at various different focal lengths, a higher f-stop number and a wider depth of field will capture more of it in focus at the same time. But the opposite is also true. If you drop down your f-stop number to be really, really small, and so your lens is wide open, this will create an incredibly shallow depth of field by comparison, meaning that less and less and less is in focus at any given time. You might notice this as having some of the qualities of the film look that you've come to appreciate, having a really razor thin depth of field so that only a really small amount is actually in focus at any given time. Having a very out of focus background can help to contrast with a really in focus subject, helping them to pop out a little bit more. A typical rule of thumb is that the lower you bring down the lens's possible f-stop number to, the more expensive the lens will become. You can really see this with Canon's lineup of 50mm lenses. Their 50mm that does a 1.8 aperture is priced at around $100. Their 50mm model that can do a 1.4 aperture is priced at about $350. And finally their crown jewel, which is a 50mm lens that can drop all the way down to 1.2. This one is priced at $1,300. Yikes. There's a bunch of other factors that go into why these lenses are priced this way, but you can start to see a general trend. But once you get down to that beautiful f-stop 1.2, your images will automatically look better, right? Wrong. Shallow depth of field actually comes with its own set of challenges. If you're a filmmaker, for example, and you open up your lens as wide as it can possibly go, you'll notice that it's really tough to keep your subject in perfect focus, especially if they're moving around a lot. Not to mention, it might be challenging to keep your scene from completely blowing out if you open up your lens all the way. It's not just about having a low f-stop number. It's actually about knowing how aperture works and how to utilize it to best suit your scene, whether or not you're shooting a subject, a landscape, or whatever you happen to be filming next. And finally, prime versus zoom. A prime lens just refers to a lens that's locked at only one specific focal length. This one is a 35 millimeter, for example. Some common examples are 24 millimeters, 35, 50, 85, 135, etc. A zoom lens, on the other hand, simply refers to a lens that can achieve various different focal lengths within the same lens body. By just twisting the lens here, you can achieve every increment in between its maximum and minimum focal length. 
So here's the question. If we've established that it's really nice to be able to have a lot of different focal lengths that you can play with, and it's also really nice to have a range of aperture that you can switch between, why wouldn't you just get a zoom lens that does everything all at the same time? Say for example, going between 30 to 300 millimeters while keeping a really low T-stop or F-stop number all the way through. The reason? Because it's pretty much borderline impossible. It's an amazing feat of engineering to be able to do something like that, and the few lenses that have been able to actually do it come with an enormous price tag attached to them. Even a lens like this, the Canon 70 to 200 millimeter lens at f-stop 2.8, will cost you about $2,000. And you're not really even getting any medium or wide angles with this lens at all. So this is why if you're not made of money, prime lenses are a really great option. So what's the benefit? Well, you can get a high quality, beautiful looking lens for a fraction of the price. It's a lot more manageable and a lot more affordable to manufacture a lens that's really good at only one particular focal length. So you're basically sacrificing the ability to zoom for a much more reasonable price. That might seem a little bit frustrating, but if your primary purpose is for filmmaking and not for photography, this can be a really huge benefit to you. Think about some of the movies that you've watched recently. Think about how often they're actually zooming with the lens as opposed to physically moving the camera closer to or farther away from the subject. Zooming while recording video can sometimes come across as having that cheap feeling. And unless you're filming the next reboot of The Office, you're probably not gonna be doing a lot of zooming while recording. A cheaper and more effective option is to simply change out your lenses when you need a different viewing perspective, or to simply move closer to or farther away from your subject to frame them differently. But wait, some of you might be saying, zoom lenses are actually integral to what I do. Like say for example, if you're a wedding filmmaker and you need to zoom in and reframe the couple in an instant where you don't have the luxury to stop and switch out your lens. Yeah, that's totally true. The point isn't to say that prime lenses are better than zoom lenses or that zoom lenses are better than prime lenses, but simply that each of them has their own pros and cons, price included. Each of them have their own specific purposes and each of them can help you to tell your stories better, whatever stories you're actually telling. The whole point of this is to simply give you guys more information when it comes to lenses. That way, the next time you're either choosing a lens, purchasing a lens, or shooting with a lens, you know a little bit more about each given scenario. But guys, that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video on lenses to be helpful. If you did, we've always got more tutorials over at motionarray.com. And for those of you here on YouTube, consider subscribing to our channel and clicking the bell icon so that you never miss whenever we post. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next video.